Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. I am going to cover a handful of topics here this week, kind of give you a little assessment of things going on through our mind and and uh, what we're doing about those things running through our minds in terms of client portfolio activity. We, um, I, I got to say that, and maybe I say this a lot, I don't think I do, but um, if I do and I run the risk of being of overkill, then forgive me. I, I really do believe that the DividendCafe.com uh, this week, our, our weekly uh, written market commentary, it's it's um, one of my favorite ones, and I, I do have some I like more than others, and I think I usually say so, um, and that's what I'm worried about, that maybe I say so too much, you're not going to take me seriously. But this week's has an important blend in my mind, about a certain economic overview, uh, uh, just a kind of basic uh, couple of educate of uh, economic principles that we try to offer educationally that I think have a lot of application understanding investment markets. Um, and there's a lot of charts and covers a lot of ground, and I just really like this week. So if you're watching the video, um, that's great. We want you to keep watching it. We want you to subscribe on our YouTube channel and like it on Facebook and send it out to people. That's all well and good. This is like uh, a video we do for public consumption as opposed to some of our private client um, uh, communications. But the, uh, the written commentary this week is worth reading in addition to watching this video, in my opinion. So some of those topics I just mentioned, I want to get into them right now. The issue regarding interest rates is a very important thing because it's not going to go away in the press anytime soon in, 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 as far as a pertinent factor in what's driving investment markets. We know that the 10-year Treasury bond has come up. It hit 3.1%. It's now back a little below 3% here this morning, but still up around the 3% range. Much, 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 much more relevant is that the short-term rates have come way up. The Fed has increased rates twice this year that are going to increase, I believe, another time next month. And then I'd say it's about 50-50 on whether or not they will at the end of the year one more time. But the point being that that pressure driving short-term rates higher and a lot less buyers coming in to buy rolled over debt because the central banks have removed a lot of their uh, stimulus in doing so, you have a, tr I mean, really, the highest short-term rates that we've seen, even though not technically on the Fed funds rate, when you're getting uh, uh, three-month treasury bonds that are trading well above 2%, um, that, you know, and it was like at 0% effectively forever, uh, this is a big deal. But here's where the economic lesson kicks in. You got to think of short-term rates as a proxy on borrowing cost. Short-term rates are pretty much the reference and benchmark uh, uh, tetheredness to for for credit lines, for a lot of credit cards. Most importantly, for bank borrowing from companies, the way in which short-term municipal bonds or corporate bonds or treasury bonds get rolled over that are short-term, and so. Entities that borrow, whether it be individual, most relevant to our conversation is companies, but also government borrowing, generally that cost has a big effect around the shorter term rate. But then you look at the 10-year treasury yield, which we consider more intermediate, you look at a long-dated bond, uh, like a 30-year uh, treasury bond, for example, that yield level is really an expression of economic growth, what is expected around a more secular constructive growth story. So I'll give you an example that I, I gave in the commentary. If you have um, a 10-year bond yield about 2%, which we had for a long, long time over the last nine years, lower than 2%, a little bit higher, but it was around that range, right, for a long time, that was an indication of very, very just awful expectations for growth. Now, that's an extreme example on the low end, a 10-year bond yield at 2%. What if you had a 10-year bond yield at 8%? On the high end, that would be an indication of severe expectation of inflation. Um, in theory, these things have got to be looked at very separately, and, and the relationship between short-term and long-term rates 
becomes much more pertinent. But when someone says rates are going higher, the fact of the matter is the short-term rate is not going higher for any uh, reason that has to do with inflation expectations or economic growth expectations in a more secular and sustainable fashion. And long-term rates are not going higher or lower based on what the Fed is doing. So the short-term rates matter in borrowing costs, and that has that will impact corporate profits. That will impact uh, money coming out of our pocket if we, we, we borrow money. And But the long-term rate tells us more about growth expectations. So what do we make of this flattening yield curve, the idea that the short-term rate has come up and the long-term rate hasn't come up as much? So rather than a, 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 bit, a broader disparity between the two, it's flattened. Um, here's what we make of it. The market is not saying, we look, we got a 3% 10-year yield because there's better expectations for secular, sustainable economic growth. Uh, still not high enough, in our opinion. And the market is certainly not pricing in or believing any type of inflation concern. On the short term, the market has moved higher as the bar, the buyers of short-term debt that from a central bank who have come in and intervened to assist in the market, drive those borrowing costs down for their own stimulative reasons, those borrowers have largely gone away. And uh, I'm sorry, the buyers have largely gone away. And that's pushed rates higher as uh, indeed they raise their, their targeted short-term rate. Um, this, this is all healthy in theory and short-term. It escalates market volatility. But if you don't have a, a long-term rate indicating significantly sustained inflation expectations, the short-term rate is trying to find its way. I happen to think the short-term rate is getting a little overcooked. I think it's overreacted or overresponded uh, to what the Fed has at least thus far done. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe the Fed uh, will and the market will prove right, and the Fed uh, does have more up their sleeve that will justify these levels. Either way, this kind of economic education is meant to say that you got to understand what we mean when we talk about rising rates, what we don't mean, what further clarity or specificity is necessary to translate that discussion into one that is, is relevant or actionable um, from the vantage point of an investor. So when you go to DimmingCafe.com, uh, we also this week will cover... Um, we have a new politics meets market section there just to kind of go through some of the stuff. Why is the market down on Thursday of this week? Because President Trump talked about some national security justification of perhaps looking at tariffs on auto imports into our country. Um, why isn't it down more based on that? Because I don't think most actors believe that anything will come from it. There seems to be a pretty good pattern the last few months of escalated market volatility around what I consider to be ill-advised trade and tariff rhetoric and yet not significant enough actuality or teeth in these different things to, to really meaningfully move us lower, uh, knock on wood. Then the North Korea summit fell apart today. That whole thing's moving target. I, I would probably not be setting an investment policy if I were you around what will the ebbs and flows of what's taking place in North Korea. Um, but that, uh, that geopolitical stuff, sometimes being a total irrelevant time waster, and we still have to cover it because others are covering it, we don't want you to be led astray. And then stuff that sometimes is substantive and important to market, we're going to continue to delve into that at, at, in our weekly Dividend Cafe. Um, so if your only means of communication with us is via the video, you don't listen to the podcast, you don't read the written commentary, I guess you're kind of getting ripped off a little, and I don't want that. I'll try to cover all the things going on in the video each week, but it's difficult because I really fear the idea of boring you to death with this, and so I don't know if people like 20-minute videos or 5-minute videos. Uh, based on Twitter, I, I suspect certain parts of the culture have a shorter attention span, but, of course, you may not be a Twitter type of audience, so who knows? Listen, uh, it, it may has been so far a good month in equity markets. We'll see what happens in the final days of the month. Monday is, of course, a holiday and a Memorial Day. I, I uh, absolutely uh, can assure you my family will be remembering those who have given their lives in war uh, throughout American history to protect the freedoms that we have. 
um, that that enable me to delve into capital markets and the world of investing for a living. It's all made possible, as is our whole free enterprise system, how, as is this entire American experiment, and, and in fact, the incredible success of American democracy in the context of Western civilization is made possible by true heroes that have lost, given their lives to, to protect us. So that's my Memorial Day send-off. Thank you very much for listening to this week's Dividend Cafe.